This is New Zealand, Aotearoa. We are blessed with majestic mountains, beautiful forests, rivers, and a spectacular wild coastline, all 19,000 kilometres of it. I'm Craig Potton, and like many New Zealanders, I actually learnt to swim not long after I could walk. I'm a photographer, a conservationist, and a surfer, and I just love the coast. I like exploring above it and in the water. On my coastal journeys, I'll encounter some wonderful sea creatures. I'll visit people that care for the coast, and I'll try to understand its place in our culture and our duty of care for it. One of the world's great wild coasts is found in the southwest corner of New Zealand. Here are some of the tallest sea cliffs on Earth, fjords carved from hard rock by huge glaciers. After the ice ages, their valleys invaded by the sea. It's awe-inspiring and sublime. It's hard but beautiful wilderness. On this journey, I will be going to places too wild for settlement. I will try to understand the strange ecology of the Fiordland waters, the expressive geology of the region, and meet some of the rarest and most wonderful creatures that live there, below and above the water. Starting on the coastline of Fiordland at Dusky Sound, we will travel across to Stewart Island and then on to the east coast of Southland, the Catlins, visiting places of exceptional remoteness and wild beauty. We're in Fiordland and it's one of the great wildernesses in the world. This is actually the fifth largest national park on the planet. And I just love wilderness. It has a huge emotional pull on me. I've been taking photographs here for the last 30 years. There are very few places left on such a scale, so untouched by humans. Down here, there's no better guide than my old friend, helicopter pilot Richard Hayes, nicknamed Hannibal. He loves and knows this area intimately and he's a national hero for his search and rescue work. How long have you been coming into Fiordland? I started doing this in 1975 when I started flying for Tim Wallace on deer recovery. I've been here ever since. That's a hell of a long time in these mountains. The place grows on you, as you well know. It's like a big magnet. Go away from it and it drags you back again. No two flights are the same. What you see out there now, the weather makes a difference. You yeah. can do six flights in one day, and I can guarantee you not one of those flights will be the same as the other one. I would say that's pretty dangerous looking country now with low cloud cover. Um, are you anxious about it, or is it something that you've just got so used to doing? You go and have a look at the passes. More often than not, there'll be one pass wide open, but if it's not open, you turn around and go home. That's, right. all, that's all there is about it. It's an unforgiving place. If you want to be silly about it, you've got to respect it. You've got to respect it. In this remote spot, you have to be ingenious. Here in Brakesy Sound, Richard has moored an ex-Navy vessel it doubles as his helipad and home away from home. I'll stay the night here, and in the morning, Richard and I will visit some special places. Dusky Sound is one of the most complex of the many fjords on this coast, and one of the largest. Only a handful of people have ever managed to live here. Even Maori who hunted in this area had no permanent settlements. But in 1773, on his second voyage to New Zealand, Captain Cook navigated his way into Dusky Sound and mapped the first charts of these waters. Today's maps are still based on this highly accurate chart, and that's why I'm here. Cook anchored for five weeks here in Pickersgill Harbour, named after his first lieutenant. 
His ship, the Resolution, needed repairs. His crew needed a well-earned rest. And he also had important scientific work to do. Looks pretty much like the spot, eh? I think so. Yeah, this, this is extraordinary. I think we're, uh, we've hit the jackpot, because this painting by Hodges, that's uh, 230 years ago. Cook was here. But this could be pretty close to it, isn't it? Well, it's got the same shape of the shoreline here and the island in the background. Yep, yep. And this log coming out, I mean, it wouldn't be the one, but same feel. No, a lot shorter of this guy here now, but that was 230-odd years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. It's kind of a neat feeling, isn't it? Yeah. Just stepping onto literally a bit of history. Cook walked here, so we shall walk there, up to Astronomer's Point. OK. Another piece of local history was made here when Cook, ever keen to utilise available resources, brewed the first beer ever made in New Zealand. So here's a uh, young Rimu, Richard. They said they actually brewed beer out of some of this bit of manuka. I think a molasses to give yeah. it a bit of sweetness. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just for, you know, the lads to sleep better at night or have a good time. It was to stop scurvy as well. OK. Vitamin C. Yeah. Yeah, he yeah. was a smart man, entertain the troops and yeah. uh, do the medicinal thing as well. Cook and his crew, they'd spend a month here at this point, provisioning, getting some rest from the wild sea. But they also had another task. On board was astronomer Wales, and he had a new instrument, a chronometer. He wanted to test it out. They had to find the latitude and the longitude and mark it accurately. And it's just up here that he cut down the trees to make what we call Astronomer's Point. Wales set up camp on the top of the hill, and then he went about clearing a good view to the stars above and the mountains around. I guess the tent was somewhere around here. Well, to me, it's the only flat spot that they would have set up right here. And this is the marker of that, do you think? Yeah. It's Pretty much where the tent was, here. Yep, yep. I, I yep. reckon, yep. And I guess they had to clear not just a hole up to the heavens, but quite wide. I'd imagine they would have cleared the whole area. Opening out. Because, yeah. you know, the, the tallest mountains are out to the east from here, so, you know, they, they could have cleared a big area. Mm. But it had certainly regenerated. In quite primitive conditions, they fixed a very, very accurate mm. point just about as far away as England yeah. you could get in terms of longitude and latitude. Yeah, you, you've certainly got to admire them for that. Like the, uh, the uh, latitude was just about bang on and the yeah. longitude was only a little bit out. It's so pretty good, pretty good going. Kind of nice to think Cook declared the chronometer trial a success. It would become one of the world's most significant advances in navigation. Back in the helicopter now, and Richard's taking me to Chalky Inlet with its incredible erosion-etched limestone cliff face and rocky shore platform that juts out into the Tasman Sea. This is a place I've often photographed from the air and longed to photograph from the ground. really is a rare privilege to walk where so few people have ever been. I'm astonished by the natural beauty of wild places. I've come past this shore platform at Chalky Island many times. It's a wonderful limestone outcrop and it throws up some real sculptural forms I love. It is probably the most distant coastal wilderness in all of New Zealand. Very few people visit it. It's just great to be here, especially in this wonderful evening light. There's something very sculptural about limestone, you know, just the forms that it makes. And just when we came around the cliff face here, it's really jutting out. It's kind of like the land opened up. It's almost like yeah. the skeleton of the land. Yeah. You know? Well, the formations are amazing, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Never get sick of it, eh? No. Magnificent. But I suppose, light being what it is, it's going. We should be out of here soon. We should be away from here shortly. Should pop over the hills in the next half hour. Get you home.
There's probably no other coastline in the world with such an unusual body of water as you will find in the fjords. We're up against Anchor Island in Dusky Sound, and it's raining. That's not unusual down here. Eight and a half metres falls every year in the fjords. And it falls on the hills, it runs through the forest, pulling tannins with it into the water, and that makes a dark layer on the top of the fjords. That dark layer creates a very unique marine environment. I'm meeting up with marine scientist Ken Grange, who is part of the Fiordland Guardian Group that has been responsible for the recent creation of marine reserves here. He was the first person to find black coral in these waters, and that is what we are looking for today. Yeah, good, good. Come on. Thank you. First dive that we did down here, we thought, that's weird. It looks like there's black coral, but it shouldn't be here because it should be deep and it should be in the northern part. So that's yeah. when we started to get the research going, yeah. When you discovered this ecology, then did you start looking for other interesting things here? Yes, yes, and, and, and there's a whole heap of that. Wherever you look, there's something new. And what do you think we will see today? I mean, we're just going to be snorkeling. Yeah, we're just going to be snorkeling. So we should be able to see urchins and starfish and we may see some black coral. The dark top layer of the fjord waters creates light levels similar to those at much greater depths in other places. This underwater gloom makes deep water species rise up closer to the water's surface. It doesn't feel too bad. Is it warm? Well, <laughs> warm might be too strong a word. <laughs> It's actually a fairly chilly 13 degrees Celsius. Confusingly, black coral looks like a plant, but it's an animal and it's actually white. It gets its name from its black skeleton, but it's covered with a white skin. This is one of the world's largest populations in shallow waters. It's been ruthlessly exploited elsewhere. Down here, there are around 7 million black corals, some up to 200 years old. <sighs> That's a rare privilege. I've got down free diving and actually seen black coral. So those corals are about 30 years old, 30 or 40 years old. Those particular ones we're seeing. Yeah. Just under a metre tall. How deep are we going? Uh, I think it's probably about six metres. And the rest of the world, how far down would you have to go? To? <laughs> I want another 25 at least. Well, yeah. I wouldn't get down there without tanks. And oh, I'm no. Not no. a tank diver. No, very few people would. Recently, Ken and his colleagues also became the first team to film at the bottom of the sounds, 100 metres down. And this amazing array of unseen sea life is some of what they found. That was pretty cool, wasn't it? That was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, you got yeah. to see one? I or, did. or several, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. The one on this side here. Yeah, yeah. Like, what? Half a metre or so tall? A bit cold. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. Are it's you okay. cold? No, I'm not too bad. You're not too but, cold. Uh, no. But, um, How do you do that? Uh, no brain, no pain. <laughs> <laughs> Today I'm visiting Pigeon Island in Dusky Sound. This was the site of the remarkable battle waged solely by one man to save our predator-ravaged native bird population. Just over a hundred years ago, Richard Henry pioneered the idea of an island sanctuary to keep the birds he loved safe, particularly the one he loved the most, the curious and wonderful big fat green parrot, the kākāpō. Anyone who's encountered the kākāpō and Richard Henry probably was the same. You're always quite enamoured with them as soon as you encounter one. So yeah, I think he did have a passion for kākāpō and he knew that the predicament on the mainland was quite serious for them and that there was no real hope of saving them on the mainland. So he saw them as a rather unique species. Richard Henry realised that the magical world of New Zealand birds was threatened by introduced predators, stoats and weasels, rats and cats. If he could put birds on an island without these predators, he reasoned they could breed in peace as they did before humans arrived. Henry and his dogs trapped birds all over Fiordland and brought them to his home here, before setting them free on nearby Resolution Island. 
He spent 14 years on this island, and the remnants of his life and work can still be seen today. This is pretty extraordinary. Right on the fireplace of Richard Henry's old house are some glass plates, very fragile. This is what he used for his photography, and he would have taken great photos with big plates like this. This is Richard Henry's... Uh... Nearby are some of the remains of Henry's punga fern cages he used as holding pens. I actually expect to see a number of them. I mean, he's not going to put a whole lot in one place, is he? Uh, well, this is probably the main one that's left, I guess, and um, there, there may have been others. He did keep kākāpō in cages. He preferred to keep them isolated because they uh, tended to fight with each other if he put them together. They're not terribly social creatures, it? unless it's a breeding season. With only the dog and birds for company, Henry had the chance to document many previously unknown behaviours of the kākāpō, in many ways, the selfless obsession for another creature saved him from himself. He was melancholic. Uh, oh, he had, he had so, a go yeah. at suicide. That's yeah. very serious. Yeah. Um, but he must have found enough meaning here, must not he? He did attempt to shoot himself in Auckland just months before he got this job. The first shot deflected off his uh, cranium and lodged in his skull somewhere, and the second shot misfired. So I think by the time he got to the third, he decided that maybe he wasn't supposed to do it. <laughs> and then he ended up here, which is, I guess, uh, was a gentle irony there that you know, someone that attempts suicide, you send him to an island for 14 years. And the impression that I get from reading his biography and his journals is that this is where he felt the most at home. Tragically though, after all those years of trying to save the birds, Henry made a terrible discovery. One day he saw a stoat in Goose Cove just up the way and I think uh, his sort of heart probably sank at that stage because he knew that if there was one there was probably more and he spent the next six to eight years trying to eliminate or even catch them and to no avail. In hindsight, it's now obvious that one man alone was never going to win the fight against such a voracious predator. And after several disconsolate years trying, Henry finally gave up his fight and he left the island for good. Richard Henry's attempt to save the Kākāpō, well, that was very tragic. But it's here on Anchor Island that his dream may well come true. Anchor Island is one of only two places where Kākāpō still exist, and only because of human intervention. In 2005, the Department of Conservation declared Anchor Island free of predators and transferred 30 of the parrots here. Thousands of years ago, the heaviest and only flightless parrot in the world roamed from coast to coast and sea to mountain top in New Zealand. Now, just 131 remain. Chris and his colleague Hannah have been working on the island since the birds first arrived, and they know them all by name. Hi, Hannah. Hi, Craig. How are we going? Good. Are we getting anyone? We're getting Trevor. We're getting Trevor, cool. Yeah, he's not that far away. Hey, Chris. Because Kākāpō are still so close to extinction, they have to be highly managed. They may be bulky, but they are speedy and strong on their short legs, and they tend to head for the undergrowth to shake off pursuers. But Hannah and Chris know their tricks. Here it is. Got it. That she was a hell of a chase, a lot worse than I expected. And we went for Trevor, but we came back with Takingi. <laughs> this truly is one of the most wonderful moments of my life. I've always loved wild animals, but Kākāpō, the world's rarest parrot. He's got a lovable head, though, hasn't he? Absolutely lovable. They've all got their own different personality. You're not imagining this? You're quite sure of this? I'm quite sure of this. <laughs> that personality has gained friends all over the world. Among them, writer Douglas Adams, who famously wrote, not only has the Kākāpō forgotten how to fly, it's forgotten it can't, and it's been known to run up a tree, jump out, and fall like a flying brick. Parrots that aren't parrots, really, are they? Mm. They're the heaviest parrot. They're a nocturnal parrot. They, they don't fly. And they've got a special way of breeding. They, the men gather in large areas and boom together to impress the ladies. And What is this boom? Well, they've, they've got these air sacs in their breast, and so they inflate those, and that puts out this booming sound, which can travel kilometres across valleys, and that's what draws the females in from a long way away. And then they have this alternate sound, which they call chinging, which is more high-pitched. We don't know, but we think that that's what brings the female to a specific male. They will go past screeds of males to get to the one that they like or that they've visited the previous years. We've got one particular female, Lisa, who will always visit Basil, no matter who's in the area, so... Basil's ching is a good ching, like a well, boom, boom ching. Well, boom and his ching, yeah. He's right. quite a prolific breeder. He's, you know, he's sired 12... Boom, ching, ching. <laughs> sired 12 chicks, so... 
Oh, wow. Oh, he's so got he's one hell of a doing, then. He's doing something right. <laughs> yeah. The breeding program on Anchor Island is still in its infancy, but the signs are good that the kākāpō will one day breed here again. See you, buddy. <laughs> Richard Henry would be pleased to know that his efforts were not in vain and that his work heralded the start of a huge ongoing task to save the Kākāpō in Fiordland. I've left Dusky Sound and I'm travelling down the Fiordland coastline to the Great Waitutu Wilderness Block. The forest here has been described by British ecologist David Bellamy as one of the most important ancient forests in the world. The easiest way to explore this area is by the Waitutu track. It's a stunning tramp. All around you can see the wild coast, the magnificent terraced forest, and the fascinating geological features. Amazingly, even though I'm high in the mountains, I'm actually standing on an ancient beach terrace. And I kind of reflect on what are the enormous pressures that must have pushed that beach up a million years ago to reach this height. Waitutu Forest is one of the larger pieces of untouched lowland forest in New Zealand, and its magic starts here on the coast. My geologist friend Les Malloy and I wrote a book on New Zealand's wilderness heritage. We both fervently believe in the need for wild places to get away from our own modern lives and to protect the world's biodiversity. Waitutu Forest is pristine, but more than that, it sits on a significant geological phenomenon a series of 13 progressively older beach terraces, each 100,000 years older than the last. Well, they're probably the best preserved and natural set of what we call uplifted marine terraces uh, anywhere in the country. So we stepped up the hill, we're stepping back in time, up a beach, beach a series of old beaches, yeah, is it that they, simple? Yeah, but they don't look like beaches right. now. The terraces give the forests a layered appearance, over half a million years ago, many earthquakes and uplift have pushed the land skywards, while along the coastline the sea level has advanced and retreated, gradually cutting new platforms as the land slowly rose. And it's still rising at half a millimetre each year. And here we are, 1,000 metres above sea level, up in the Alpine. Well, we've just been transported nearly a million years, Craig, right up onto uh, the highest of the marine terraces. The modern day coastline is way, way down there, a thousand metres below us. How do you know that this rock here came out of the ocean a million years ago? Well, it's the sandstone. If you looked at them very, very closely, you'd see there's just sand grain sized particles in there. Sand turned to stone. The Waitutu Wilderness Block is now recognised as part of a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which runs through all Fiordland to South Westland, and it ranks alongside Yellowstone National Park and the Grand Canyon. But in the 1920s, it came close to being milled. The forestry company built a spectacular bridge, the Percy Byrne Viaduct, to get the logs to the port. However, the venture was troubled right from the start. The Marlborough Timber Company lasted until about 1928 to 1930, they probably overcapitalized. The port itself started silting up, the depression came along, and so they walked away from it, leaving, really, this fantastic piece of historic archaeology. You'd have to say this is an amazing engineering feat. It's 36 metres high, one of the tallest wooden viaducts in the world. Now it's one of the features of the Waitutu walking track. But in the 1970s, the idea of logging a large area of the forest came up again. Les and I joined many others in the Forest and Bird Society and the Federated Mountain Clubs in the fight to save it. After years of protests and lobbying, we were successful and the forestry plans were halted. In 1998, 48,000 hectares of Waitutu Forest were added to Fiordland National Park. This beautiful forest had come so close to disappearing forever. I'm leaving Waitutu behind and travelling to another great wilderness area of the far south, Stewart Island. I'm on the east coast of the island in Oban's Half Moon Bay and going out with researchers to see one of the world's most feared animals, the great white shark. 
Hi. Is it Clinton? Yes. Clinton All Duffy right. from the Department of Conservation has studied the Stewart Island population of sharks and their movement outside these waters for the past five years. These waters are a favourite haunt for the great whites, but surprisingly little is known about these remarkable creatures. The white pointer shark, it's one of the most extraordinary creatures on the planet, and sadly, it's one that's becoming very rare. They've been around for some 300 million years or more in a very similar form to the they are now. And they can handle the world's greatest oceans. They're one of the top predators on the planet. And sadly, we're driving them to extinction. We're anchoring alongside Edwards Island, which has often been a successful location for luring the sharks. There's a degree of tension in the air because although they're often cautious animals, they're also big, and boy, they can be unpredictable. A burly trail is laid, and now it's just a waiting game. I don't think we're pulling the sharks in from, you know, kilometres away. I mean, essentially what we've got is a population of sharks that's living around, living around these islands, moving around the islands, and we're just trying to make it easy for them to find out where we are. You have to keep your eyes out. They don't swim up the boat with their dorsal fin out of the water okay. and then to tail make it easy. They, they are fairly cautious um, animals around the boat. But the fact that pulling the shark... 10.22, shark up. Go for it. That's extraordinary. He is very, very big, and yet they're only saying he's a middle-sized one. And he's very, very cautious. He's actually approaching a boat and going around it very slowly several times, obviously very aware that there's people, there's a boat. Over millions of years of evolution, great whites have developed some incredible adaptations. They have four rows of serrated teeth, and if they lose a tooth, within 24 hours, a tooth from behind will move forward to fill the gap. And when great whites attack, to protect their eyes from injury, they roll them back into their sockets. Today's aim is to tag as many sharks as possible with locator devices so that Clinton and his team can track where they go. Two sharks! Two sharks! You don't often get much time to think about getting the tag in. You have to take it as it presents itself. Oh! Yes! Nice move, guys. 419. <laughs> 419 tagged. Well tagged. How many have we got tagged this season? Well, that was number 20 for the season. It's an ex been exceptional in terms of the number of tags we've had out. The exciting thing about that is those sharks will be registering on the receivers out on the moorings that we've got scattered around the islands. So we should be collecting data right as we speak. Just about half of the sharks that we saw last year uh, we've seen back again so far this trip. So. The research so far has overturned previous ideas about great whites migration. It was thought that the sharks spent most time in New Zealand waters with some movements to Australia. In fact, what has surprised Clinton's team is the amount of time the sharks spend in the warm waters of the Pacific. Until the advent of these satellite tags, white sharks were thought to be cold water, shallow coastal species, and they now appear to be tropical, subtropical, oceanic species that occasionally visit cold waters around New Zealand. They may actually be tropical species that just visit New Zealand to feed. They're in areas where there's lots of seals. It's really high productivity supporting, you know, large biomass of fish, seals, dolphins. That was the most incredible day out there with white pointers. They are the most sleek, beautiful animals that you can imagine. And as a surfer, I'm still anxious about them. In their own element, they've got it all over me. I mean, they could take me out in one bite. But there's a real irony there. They are going to disappear off the planet unless we are very careful in the way in which we manage them. Most of Stewart Island is as it was before people ravaged nature, something one rarely sees in today's world. 
And there are few places more extraordinary than the huge dunes at Mason Bay on the western side of the island. The dunes, thousands of years old, run the length of Mason Bay. They're the biggest and one of the very last of New Zealand's great sand dune systems. There's a very stark and today a very wild beauty to the sand dunes of uh, Mason's Bay. It's one of New Zealand's largest intact natural systems and it's a wonderful place to come to visit and to photograph. As well as their wild beauty, the dunes have huge appeal to scientists. Geography lecturer Dr Mike Hilton has spent the last 14 years studying them as part of a management project which is trying to undo previous human attempts to control them. About windblown sand. Exactly. I mean, it's wild <laughs> coast and we're on a very wild sand dune. And we've got a nice wild day for it too. Absolutely. So, um, why, just why are sand dunes so important to us? Well, they're part of our coast, part of our character. And they're just generally impressive places to be and see. I guess they were widespread ones, and now there are really only a few left. If you look around, there are species that are only found in this dune system, nowhere else. What makes these systems so fascinating is their highly mobile nature. The sand is always moving, and this mobility is essential to the survival of the plants and the animals that live here. The plants are very resilient. They can survive drought, high wind, burial. In fact, they need some burial, many of them, to thrive. The plants behind us, the pico, are thriving because the sand is moving into them and bringing fresh nutrients and stimulating their growth. What they don't survive is being trampled on and they don't survive stability, which is an unusual notion. So these plants have got to have a moving context to live and they, to a certain extent, move themselves? Uh, yes, they do. I mean, they all produce seed and that seed blows down wind. And the seed is transported pretty rapidly on a day like this, kilometres over a few hours or days. But their mobile nature comes head to head with human nature, which tries to stop them moving and covering farmland. All over New Zealand, attempts are being made to stabilise them with very aggressive marum grass, and that threatens everything else which needs the dunes to be moving in order to survive. Mike's project is trying to replace all that marum grass with native pingao and let the dunes roll again. Can we get rid of marum though? I mean, this is a relatively costly exercise. Yes. Is it real or are we sort of dreaming a little bit here? No, I think it's very real. We've cleared marum essentially from 80 hectares and we're now only a half a kilometre or so from the coast and we expect in the next five years the department would have cleared marum back to the sea. The scale and the beauty of the Mason Bay dune system is one of New Zealand's great natural treasures. It's one of the jewels in the crown really. I mean, most people think of sand dunes as some sort of sheet of sand with a scatter of plants, but in fact there's a, a detail, a complexity in there, which is quite incredible. I'm staying the night in Mason Bay in an old original farmhouse at the southern end of the sand dunes. Hi. There you go. Must be Paul. I am indeed. <laughs> Paul Dustin's grandfather built the house, and it's where Paul spent all his school holidays. Pretty fine spot you got here. Oh, uh, yeah, just don't tell too many people. This place was the most southerly point in New Zealand at which anyone has tried to farm. That ended in the mid-80s when the Department of Conservation bought the land for a national park. Fortunately for Paul, as a descendant of the original farmers, he can keep the house and keep coming here for holidays. Did they actually make a living or did they have to supplement it with something else? Uh, well, they did a lot of fishing. Fishing and boat buildings and been in the Lesk family for forever, so yeah. yeah. And even when I was a kid, um, we would all fly in and Dad would, would be fishing around the area, codding or grey fishing, and, and he would moor in, in the gutter there. And... But what do you remember? What are your first memories of this place? Well, probably tearing up and down the beach from the motorbikes. It's not the sort of thing that you'd probably get away today in the National Park, yeah. but um, as kids, every year I would come through for a holiday and I'd bring one of the boys from school and we would do things like, you know, riding around on the motorbikes and no, no crash helmets and just the bush. Just yeah. making stuff out of the bush, building tree hats, going possuming and just get up in the morning as soon as it was light and you'd be gone, you know. This is a harsh and extreme environment, but the farmhouse is nestled in the shelter of one tough strand of trees. 
Oh, you can't go past our historic Macrocarpus shelter belt, though. Absolutely, so yeah. If they weren't there, the house wouldn't be, so... Well, I'd love to go down to the gutter. Maybe we should hit off while the weather's pretty good, huh? Absolutely. The gutter is a channel at the end of Mason Bay, and it's the wild coast at its most spectacular and unforgiving. Sadly, two of Paul's family were drowned here. Mum's brother and sister drowned out there. I don't think they ever found them. Just out there fishing, and uh, yeah, never came back. What, a little boat or? A little wooden boat. I mean, it must have been a fairly calm day to even contemplate going out there. Uh, you'd like to think so. On the far side of the gutter stand the Pinnacles, a huge rock formation that is constantly pounded by the sea. It's a place I'm keen to photograph. It's pretty wild, eh? <laughs> Still, I think that's a good shot. I'm at the southern limit of my coastal journey, and it is a very wild place on a wild day, and that kind of suits. No one lives south of here. It's the same Antarctic Islands and it's Antarctica next stop. So I'm going north again, but I do love these wild places. Oh. And they could are oh, clean. We've so. been hammered by subantarctic winds all day, so that humble house is looking pretty inviting. At times like this, nothing beats a fire and a hot brew. I'm heading to the southeastern edge of the mainland, to the wild and remote Catlins region. There are a couple of very special places I've come to visit in this beautiful windswept place. My first stop is the Terreri Reserve, where I will see one of our rarest penguins, the jaunty little yellow-eyed penguins. They only live on our southeast coast and the subantarctic islands further south. A penguin colony was discovered by the Forest and Bird Society here in 1980, just as the local farmer was about to bulldoze the land. These penguins only nest in the shore vegetation, so Forest and Bird convinced the farmer to fence off a small section of land to protect them. In time, another 100 acres were added, and volunteers set out on a massive planting program. Did you plant all that flax, or is it pretty much yeah, done? Yeah, everyone here is planted. It's our major plant in these exposed headlands. Right. Just... Brian Rance has been involved since the start, so he understands the needs of these penguins. The yellow eyes are different to most penguins. They're not social animals. You know, quite often we see colonies of birds all crammed together. The yellow eyes won't nest in sight of one another, so they like to spread out. So to get that room, they've got to go further inland, find those quiet, secluded places under banks and under logs where they've got that cover, the shelter, but also the privacy that they like. Yellow-eyed penguins usually mate for life. They'll only find a new partner if their first one dies. They have a thick layer of fat to keep them warm in the water, but on the land they will often overheat, so they need the shelter to stay cool. I believe after a real effort of over a decade, you had a real tragedy here. Yes, in, in 1995, there was a, a fire um, it started in surrounding farmland and just the location of that fire, it swept around the coastal habitat and so that was where the penguins were concentrated and also where the penguins had to pass through to get out to the sea. Generated. A lot were killed in the fire directly, some had to be put down because of horrific damage to their feet by walking through the smouldering areas and it was really horrific times for the penguins and, and for the manager. But the colony managed to survive and their faithful human supporters doggedly replanted the area again. In his 30 years of caring for these birds, Brian has grown to love their quirkiness. They're not necessarily the smartest birds, but they've got character. There's no other bird that's quite like them, really. The way that they have short legs and they hop along, and just here, you see them come across the boulders and they're jumping, you know, their little legs and big feet, jumping from boulder to boulder. You see yeah. them walking along and trip and stumble, and you can't help but laugh, but you're sort of, I think, laughing with them, really. Right. Hey, hey, look at these guys scrapping. What's that? One's sort of certainly showing his dominance there, showing who's boss. I've just gone back in the water. It's a bit unusual, really, so 
Great to see. Sometimes if something spooks them, they might go back in, but... Well, something spooked, that was the other guy. Yeah, then. that's oh, right. There's no doubt who the spook was. Yeah. I mean, who needs enemies if that's your friend? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is a vulnerable time of the year for the birds, as many of them are still molting. Confined to the shore, yellow-eyed can lose half their body weight as they wait for their new feather coats to grow. So the replanting here to create a habitat for the yellow-eyed penguins, it does seem to be working. Here's proof of it. In the last year, new breeding pairs have taken up residence in the Terere Reserve. It's a slow but encouraging recovery. I'm at Curio Bay and I'm with the most amazing fossilised trees that you're going to find anywhere in New Zealand. Huge, great long trunks laid out across this land here for us just to come and look at what it was like 170 million years ago right here. This beach is recognised as a fine example of an ancient podocarp forest. Low tide at Curio Bay reveals a bizarre landscape frozen in time. This is a really good example of one of the stumps. It's huge. Yeah. Hundreds of years old. And this one would have grown here. This one's been knocked off, the logs fallen away, and it's left the stump and it's petrified really quickly. It's... And you can see the rings in the trunk. Yeah. I'm telling its trees. age, so it would have been a big tree. It's off the beaten track here, but people come from all over the world to see this petrified forest. Sheila Smith came from the other side of the world too, to settle with her kids and Kiwi husband. She was fascinated by the story of the petrified forest, so researched its history. Yeah, so these trees really have come in in a flood. And um, this area was a floodplain in what was called the large continent of Gondwana land, Australia and basically the South Pole. Mm. This floodplain was flanked on the north and the south by volcanoes. And the, what's happened is the, the lava's come down taken off the trees, they floated in a flood down to here, stayed, and very, very quickly the process of silification or petrification, whatever you want to call it, has occurred. Mm. And um, the, the cellulose or the organic matter within the wood has been replaced by the mineral silica um, or whatever was in the lava. That is why the wood actually looks like wood but is actually stone. Well, it's a perfect description of fossilising, isn't it, it is. really? Yes. Yeah. So this is one of the longer trees, a really good example of the podocarps that were here. Not my kind of forest, because I'm an import, as you know, so I'm expecting oak or ash, but this isn't like that, is it? Well, no. This is a podocarp, like a rimu or a kakatea, oh, yeah. our native trees. And a lot of New Zealand trees have remained here in a way that we've lost them in other parts of the world, because we just didn't have the browsers, the browsing animals, the mammals. And uh, so evolution's kind of slowed down. So this petrified forest, it's not actually hugely different than some of the trees would see back on, on your property. Just across the road from the petrified forest is a living native forest, a reminder of the ancient forest that once grew here. In this forest, you get a good idea of how the trees and ferns would have looked before they were turned to stone. Sheila and her husband own the surviving forest and have recently formed a trust to protect it. Now visitors to Curio Bay can see both the fossilised forest and the ancient living one. From ancient forests to rugged coastlines, a relic from the not quite so distant past is returning to the Catlins coastline. In the 1800s, the sealers killed all the sea lions on the coast. They are now only found in the subantarctic islands. But remarkably, recently a few have returned to the mainland on Otago Peninsula and here in the Catlins. There's the active adolescence. And those slowing down a bit. Quite a bit, but they earn their rest. Sometimes they swim 175 kilometres out to sea to get their food. All in all though, it's not a bad life here on the Catlins. Sea lions started to return in the 1970s, first to visit and now to breed. To get close to these wild creatures just makes my heart sing. In this journey, I've come through some of the wildest coastline in New Zealand, the incredible wilderness of Fiordland, one of the largest wildernesses in the world. 
Stewart Island and here at the Catlins. Wilderness is not something that we can easily visit. Sometimes it's pretty rough out there, but we need it almost as an antidote to our overplanned society. And these animals here, as I finish, the sea lions behind me have come back after a hundred years of not being on this coast. They have returned. That's surely a hopeful sign that humans can live alongside wilderness and get something from it. This program was made with funding from New Zealand On Air.